Welcome to this video, part 19 of the pre-world championship match series. And uh, this is the last game presented here for world champion Vichy Arnold. And uh, for the last two games, one games, one game each for, for both players, I chose to um, present a game from each player's up to now career highlight. I think every every chess player has um, sort of the kind of uh, yeah, tournament of his life, the event that he will be mostly remembered for, or simply the event where everything sort of falls into place. And um, yeah, you can go through chess history and always find those events if you, let's say, start with recent chess history for Fischer, it is certainly is the run for the World Championship with the Interzonal 1970 in um, Palma, then the matches where he beat Larsen and um, Termanov 6-0. This is certainly Fischer's finest hour, culminating in the, in the match in Reykjavik, but um, he certainly played even better in the candidates beforehand. Um, for Karpov, it is certainly Dinaris 1994. For Kasparov, probably Wyke 1999. It's uh, difficult for Kasparov though because he had such an amazing career that uh, you can take many tournaments. But probably Wyke 1999 is the most remarkable one. He won the tournament with 10 out of 13. And among the games, he had this fantastic game against Topalov where he hunted down the king on D1. <laughs> As White, the black king, traveled all the way to D1. Um, yeah, and for Kramnik it was certainly the match against Kasparov in London, where he beat um, Kasparov very convincingly. And um, if we come to Anand, of course the subject here of this um, series, um, his best performance to date and um, an absolute highlight is um, his match win against Kramnik in 2008. I think everyone agrees that in 2008 when he played Kromnik this was um, the best Arnold ever played and um, just to put it into perspective I think if he would come to that level in the match against Carlsen I think Arnold will win the match whatever Carlsen is doing Arnold would win but uh, it's hard to <laughs> hard to get to that level um all right so let's see we um, travel back to 2008, the World Championship match in Bonn. Arnold already was World Champion, winning the title in Mexico City in this tournament. I already presented a game. I think it was the game against Grishuk, White against Grishuk, where he won the tournament. And then Kramnik had the right to challenge Arnold in a match. This happened 2008 in Bonn, Germany. Just couple of miles away from, from my town here. Yeah. Bonn is not far away. Um, and uh, they played the 12 game match and Anand won very convincingly. Um, you could choose um, any of the three wins or good interesting games and um, I'm going to show game five here. And um, it, It's a hard choice. It's a hard choice. All three wins by Anand or the draws even were interesting. <laughs> But um, I'm going to go for game five. And at the time, Arnold already led the match by one point. He had won game three in the same opening that we see in this game. So let's uh, get ahead. Arnold playing black. It's uh, the semi-slav, one of his main defenses throughout uh, his career. And uh, Kramnik goes for e3. Kramnik also has played uh, bishop g5 often, but um, he somehow didn't uh, dare to, to choose it in the match. Arnold always played h6. Here the Moscow variation, where white can give up the bishops for good central control. Or, oops, this was a bit too much. Nope. Or can play bishop h4 leading to this um, to this very sharp gambit line. We actually saw this later when Arnold um, played with the white pieces against uh, Kromnik. In a later match situation, Kromnik played that as black to sharpen up the, the fight he needed to, to win badly. 
But uh, this wasn't on the agenda for, for Kramnik. He played e3, just like he did in game three. He repeated the same opening. Knight bd7, okay, both players, <laughs> of course, repeat. Bishop uh, to d3. And now the capture. So we have the main line of the so-called Moran variation. Bishop d3. And uh, here's the first interesting uh, parting of the ways here. Black has three moves, um, main moves available. Uh, maybe four moves. <laughs> um, Anand's main choice always was Bishop b7. In recent years, after the match in Bonn, he also more frequently adopted this bishop d6 move, which is a relatively new development that this um, move is, um, is played. This is also the move that he played to beat uh, Aronian in this amazing game in the beginning of 2013, a game that certainly would belong in this uh, series here of the great games, but uh, I, I wanted to present games that I haven't shown before on video. So if you want to see a true attacking gem by Anand, go back to January 2013 in my channel to the Weik and Zee Starters Year Tournament Aronian against Anand. Um, yeah, and there's another move. Um, this is A6. This is the oldest move. And um, Anand had never played this before the Bonn match. But uh, this was his preparation. A6, of course, intends to play a direct c5, while bishop b7, this is the other move, intends to play b4 and c5, uh, not playing a6 at all, mostly. And here we get this immediate c5. And this leads to very sharp play now. White basically is now faced, uh, not faced, <laughs> forced, uh, forced to, to push some of the central pawns, either d5 or e5, both is possible. Kromnik chose e5, this is the, maybe the oldest continuation, it's all dating back to the 1920s. Um, yeah, and black here is um, forced to capture on d4, there's uh, no other move. You don't really have a good square for this knight. For instance, you don't want to get into this kind of structure. This looks very ugly. White plays e6 soon and will get a, an amazing attack. You have to play this capture on d4. And at first this looks, um, looks really great because if white captures, you will get e5 and just win. But um, white has a funny counter move. <laughs> he takes on b5, just removing the knight on c3 from the attack. And um, yeah, now it's a kind of a complicated position. All kinds of pieces are hanging. And black here has uh, more than one possible move. Can uh, take here, can play knight g4, all kinds of uh, move possible. But um, Anand here goes for the simple recapture. And um, he had already played this in game three and presented a new idea here at the time, a new idea. White, of course, needs to recapture on f6 to get back the piece. And now Anand plays g takes f6. This was known before the match, but um, what was new is what's coming next. Castles, queen b6, queen to e2, attacking this pawn. And here, Anand's um, yeah, new idea. It's almost a new idea. I think there was like one um, one game played uh, years ago before before the match, um, where Bishop B7. This is the new move, or the let's say uh, <laughs> uh, resurrected move, <laughs> Bishop B7. Um, uh, this was the new idea, and um, we should pause for a moment to. To have a look at this position, yeah, what is Black doing? He's um, positioning this bishop on the best possible diagonal, but um, he doesn't really care about the b5 pawn. So um, White can White can um, get get this pawn, and uh, then also would pin the knight on d7. The whole position is really geared towards um, keeping the king in the center. Black rarely can, can castle here. 
uh, hard to imagine how, how you could, uh, could accomplish that. The whole position is really um, kind of, yeah, let's not say irrational, but it's really um, a very calculation heavy um, position. And this is in accordance to Anand's match strategy for this match in Bonn. He uh, really made a conscious de decision to go for lines that um, are more concrete than abstract, where it's um, about calculation and sometimes also a bit about yeah, an imaginative play, because he uh, thought that in a dry technical position, Kromnik is the better player, which is probably uh, probably true. And uh, this is exactly the opposite strategy um, compared to his um, strategy against Topalov in Sofia 2010, where he tried to play uh, as um, yeah played really dry technical chess if uh, if possible, because Topalov uh, is in fact the complete opposite of Kromnik's, trying to. Um, play very sharp games based on uh, on preparation and um, this shows and this is an enormous strength of Arnold's nowadays that he has um, gotten to um, to know his own strength and uh, has a good analytical skill for um, judging how to how to play against a certain opponent and uh, this is also what um, makes me curious about this match because in just on paper it's pretty clear that Carlsen is the favorite he had the much better results but it's not clear at all in in a one-to-one -one match if this really translates into points if uh, Anand somehow manages to to find the key to um, to playing Carlsen I have no idea what this key might be but uh, <laughs> um. But uh, we will see. Maybe he has some idea how to how to um, how to play exactly against this opponent. Okay, so let's uh, get back to the game. I talked much, uh, <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed it anyway. Okay, so White now took on b5. Kromnik um, in game three. We had exactly the same position in game three. Um. um I'm sorry, I, I'm, I read my notes wrong. He played the same in game three. The, the next point is here. Um, Arnold now plays rook g8. Exactly, he's the one to get in the new idea first. In the third match game, he had played bishop to d6, which is also interesting. It's not uh, not bad at all. And um, analysis after the game showed that uh, bishop d6 is... Um, it's a perfectly all right um, move. Um, it continued a uh, rook d1, by the way, and then rook g8. So it's um, it's uh, similar to what happens in the game, where rook g8 was played uh, immediately. So Kramnik is the f um, and Arnold is the first to get in the novelty, which is uh, always a clever strategy if you somehow know that your opponent has uh, prepared a new move. Of course, if he lost the um, first game with this line, he will deviate somehow, um, and you get in your surprise first. Always a good strategy, and uh, it's obvious that the rook belongs on g8. It's just a question: you put it on g8 now or one move later? And now, this is the new move order: rook g8. Yeah, and um, bishop f4 played. Yeah, white always can take on um, on d7 if he wishes so. But um, this does not really lead to much. At first, it looks a bit strange having the king on um, on d7. But where exactly uh, is the attack? It's really a problem. Black has this fa fantastic bishop, and um, you don't really have any attacking pieces. Also, note that the pressure on the long diagonal can get uh, dangerous really quickly. Just for instance, let's say a move like that. Black can even go for this idea, just attacking here. And um, something like that even wins um, the exchange immediately. It's tricky. You shouldn't really take on d7. This bishop 
um, it's setting up um, a pin and um, you shouldn't take um, too quickly it is an idea but uh, not um, not well timed at the moment he played bishop f4 which seems okay and now bishop to d6 logical this piece needs to be developed and um, why not exchange here you need to uh, get this also out this piece because you at one point want to play king e7 to connect the rooks so a logical move and now bishop g3 this also makes uh, lots of sense because it blocks the g file so the rook is not so effective on g8 and uh, Anand plays f5 yeah just strong active moves it um, intends to play f4 harassing the bishop on g3 yeah here of course um Kramnik um, had to make a decision. It's uh, it's difficult in this position to um, to decide on a move because there are many possibilities and ob obviously it's very complicated. He played um, rook f to c1, putting a rook on the c file. Um, you also could could have considered other moves. For example, just to to have a look, rook f to d1 looks like a good idea at first attacking the pawn but um, this is answered by f4 and uh, this can get tricky really quickly have a look at that bishop here and now the very strong move rook to a5 yeah what exactly is this move doing let's uh, let's check quickly it now attacks the bishop and the bishop needs to, to do something. It probably has to take. Check. And now the problem is you cannot take on d4. This is just a disaster. Check. Oops, sorry, this was a bit too much. <laughs> I was still looking at this. Check. This position yeah what uh, should why do you can um, play something like that getting the king out of out of the long uh, out of this g file but um, black is simply uh, much much better here he's got this active pawns two active bishops and this is just uh, placed um, very badly black can also easily protect his pawn if he wants to even a move like e5 is, uh, is sometimes possible. Rook a5 is a very um, remarkable idea in this position. There are also um, tactical ideas, let's say, like knight e5, setting up this pin. Here black can also um, react by the funny move f4. Uh, oops, not f4, d3 first, sorry. First, you need to play d3, attacking the queen. The idea Check. is after that. Now white um, has some problems. <laughs> All pieces uh, are hanging at the moment. If you um, look at this continuation. Oops. Black is, uh, black is winning using this this pin and uh, it's, it's really going downhill very quickly with rook g2 coming it's a it's a very dangerous position very dangerous uh, Kromnik played um, played fine played a fine move he played rook fc1 as mentioned before and now um the next moves um, Arnold plays are just uh, good, strong, to the point. He played f4 and bishop e7. This is the kind of move that is... Um, yeah, it, it looks like an easy move to play, but you still need to um, decide to, to actually do it. It uh, exchanges the bishop on h4, which does not really make such a great impression. And the bishop on d6 looks like a fine piece, so why would you exchange h4? The good point is simply you need um, a square for the king on e7 to connect rooks. This is why bishop e7 is a good move. It just exchanges the bishop 
and make sure you have um, have a place for for your king. Yeah, a four plate. It's um. It's better to to do it that way. Takes here. Note that um, you cannot really take here. This is hanging, but a uh, eight also. Check. So he took on h4. This is the right one. Knight takes, and now king e7. As mentioned, the king wants to get out of this pin, and you want to connect rooks. This has um, been accomplished now. But, um, yeah, of course, there are there are always uh, tactical things to to be considered in, in this position. What Check. about knight f5, for example? Yeah, black can just retreat here. And um, g2 is the problem. So this check leads nowhere. White basically needs to go back. In this position, if you feed this uh, to a computer, it will sometimes come up with the remarkable move g3, which I'm sure no strong human player would uh, consider opening up the long diagonal. And uh, also something like, just uh, to show, this is something that would instantly frighten you if you are human. Lines like this. Check. Just uh, disastrous for white. Of course, you can take here, covering g3. But it all looks shaky, really shaky. So g3 is a move I don't think a human player would consider. Um, Kromnik plays a human move. He played uh, rook a3, which um, covers the third rank especially the sensitive f3 square so um an, un an understandable decision yeah Anand played rook a to c8 yeah using the a8 rook and um, opposing this rook on c1 yeah white does not really have anything better than taking on c8 this rook is hanging and moving it away does not uh, lead to much he exchanged and played the rook back to a1. So this wasn't the most successful operation, but um, it's a very difficult position anyway to play. And Kromnik really um, doesn't have, didn't do anything wrong here. The position is still um, equal, but equal in a very um, dynamic way. There's still lots of things uh, going on. And um, if I remember correctly, I don't have information in my my notes here about the time spent but i think kromnik uh, was down on time this um happened frequently in the match queen c5 activating the queen and intending to use it maybe on e5 we we'll see this see this later queen g4 played attacking here and controlling g8 and now queen e5 black centralizes the queen and keeps it closer to the king so black has a nicely centralized position all pieces are active it's uh, not easy to play for white especially considering that this knight is a bit is a bit offside this is also why he played uh, knight f3 getting it back into the game and uh, queen to f6. Kromnik now played rook e1, preventing knight e5. This was a possibility for black, so he prevents that. And rook c5 again introduces this idea. Yeah, now b4 was played kicking the rook and um, setting the pawns into motion and uh, now rook c3 yeah now we get to the to the critical point of this game kromnik here being somewhat low on time played them at first very nice looking move knight takes uh, D4. I remember I watched this live back then and uh, I really thought, oh, why? Or I thought, wow, 
is Dwight uh, Dwight winning now? He played knight takes d4, but uh, in fact this um, contains. Yeah, this is a poison pawn. Black has uh, set up a very nice trap here. We see um, why this is not working. What he should do probably is to play um, knight d2, getting away this knight from this possible capture. And uh, this position is still super difficult to uh, to play. Black is still nicely centralized, active pieces, but these are also strong pawns. And uh, yeah, well, you know, this king can get an issue. I can can become a problem. The position is still completely unclear. If you um, give it to a modern day computer, already five years ago this game was played. It um, it is about it's about equal the computer assessment. But this is just um, yeah, this is just some numbers um, given by a machine. Human players with limited time here will the put up. Well, it will lead to a very tough fight and you don't know what uh, is going to happen. It's just a very unclear position, which is exactly what Arnand was looking for, getting this kind of complicated murky positions. And then, in, and um, Kramnik here really uh, made this mistake, knight takes d4. If um, you don't know the game, you can treat this as a puzzle if you want and try to now calculate the, the coming line. Um, yeah, I'll keep silent uh, for a couple of seconds so you can pause the video to, to try to calculate the coming complications. Alright, I continue now. It's of course not only the next move, which is probably uh, very clear, black like captures, but what is the, the big problem that uh, Kramnik overlooked here? We see what's coming. Rook d1, attacking the queen. And of course, the idea is if the queen now moves, then rook takes d7, Check. just wins for white. But black has, of course, the move knight f6, attacking on g4. This is um, probably what um, Kramnik saw. He didn't overlook the move. But uh, the real problem comes a couple of moves later. Rook takes d4. What else? Knight g4. And now white Check. gets the bishop back. If you try to calculate, I hope you got this far. And uh, now what you need to do is you need to see the next two moves. And this is also a motif to remember. It, it, it sometimes really occurs in games. Check. Just like here. Rook c1 check. Bishop f1. And of course you note back rank issues. But um, how to exploit it? Black has a cute way to, to instantly win the game and of course Anand played it instantly. Knight e3. This is the decisive move. It's very nice just attacking the, the bishop and white white needs to capture. What else? And after the recapture there's the threat e2 utilizing the pin on the first rank and there's absolutely no way to prevent it. The only way to, to, to slightly delay it is uh, rook to c7. But black can just take and return next move after a g pawn move. Check. This. Check. Check. Leads to being a whole rook down, not even an exchange or something. And uh, after f takes e three, Kramnik in fact resigned the game, and um, that leads to Arnand having a two point lead after after five games after which um, it's a 12 game match it was a 12 game match the match was basically almost over you couldn't uh, really think that um, that Kromnik could come back from being uh, two games down after five games especially losing two white games which is really unheard of he basically never loses his white and he lost two white games in fact Arnand directly after game five in game six won yet another game so he led by three points after six games and therefore um, the match was, was really decided. Kramnik actually managed to win a game in not quite sure game 10 or something around game 10 to, um, to, to 
to come come closer, like only being two points down, but still Anna with no problems uh, managed to um, to to win the match even one one game uh, earlier than uh, than needed. So an excellent performance in um, in Bond two thousand eight, his best performance yet, and um, yeah, let's hope that um, he will be in good shape against um, Carlsen, that we have a, a good competitive match. One thing is clear, if he's not in its absolute best shape, it uh, could get a dis could uh, become a disaster. But on the other hand, as I, managed, uh, as I mentioned, uh, if he would um, somehow manage to, um, to get close to this form of 2008, it will be a, a very, very interesting and tough match to, uh, to watch. Yeah, thanks for watching this game. I'll be back tomorrow showing one of uh, Carlsen's finest wins from his uh, best tournament uh, to date. And this will be the 2009 Nanjing tournament in uh, China. Yeah, let's uh, talk again tomorrow about a game from that tournament. Bye.